if he is also all-powerful and therefore should have the power to remove or prevent evil, can exist when there obviously is so much evil? It's the question of, is he just not actually as powerful as we thought, and he therefore can't really do what he would like to do to stop evil? Or a worse scenario is he maybe not as good as he claims to be and therefore doesn't really care about everything that he sees. There's obviously a lot more to the problem of evil, but that really encapsulates the issue. And if you reconsider Habakkuk's complaints, that's really what he's wrestling with. He's seeing the, the amp, rampant evil all around him, and he's seeing that, that God doesn't seem to be doing anything. And so he's crying out. He's shouting out. And as we talked last night about this, Habakkuk isn't coming from a place of skepticism. I think we tend to think, you know, we think of questions about the problem of evil as people coming to, to <clears throat> deny God and to, to show that this God couldn't exist. That's not what Habakkuk's doing. It's actually his faith that's causing him to engage this problem of evil. It's in faith that he, he actually believes in power, in God's power and in his goodness, which is why he has this question. You see it in his complaint about the Chaldeans. Right? You are of purer eyes than to even see evil. How can you use these guys? What's that assuming? It's assuming that God is good. He's perfectly good. So good that he can't even look at evil. And you see the other thing that he's said to God, you know, why do you idly look at traitors? Why are you idly standing by? And what does that assume? It assumes that God could do something. That he does have the power and ability to address evil, and he simply isn't. Right? Consider the power of an idling car. If a car's idling, its engine's working, it's got the power to go, it just needs to be put into gear. And that's really the essence of Habakkuk's question. He's saying, God, when are you going to put it into gear? When are you going to move on this? When are you going to take action? See, Habakkuk's faith in who God is and what he's able to do is precisely why he's burdened. Because he thinks something more should be happening. It's because he believes God is all good and all powerful, that he finds the realities of evil and oppression and injustice burdensome. And it's because of those things that he actually goes deeper in this questioning. Now, if you look at your passage here, several scholars have noted that, that in verse 14, when Habakkuk is making this reference to creation and, and God is the creator of mankind, that he's pushing past the basic question of why don't you do something in this situation to the deeper question of why are things like this at all? You have created all mankind. You're the one that's created them like fish. And you've created, created others as those who pull them out and destroy them. It's the question, why do the wicked exist at all? It's the problem of evil. And again, Habakkuk is, is showing us here that these are not just the questions of the unbelieving and of the skeptical. The presence of these sorts of questions in Habakkuk and throughout Scripture show us that these are not just the questions that faithful people might have. They are the questions that faithful people should have. We talked a bit about that last night, right? If I believe that God is all-powerful and all-good, then I should find the presence of evil burdensome. It should bother me. Right? If God is all-powerful and all-good, why is it that globally... There are about 20.9 million victims of human trafficking. If God is all good and all powerful, then why is it that every year around 600 to 800,000 people, half of whom are children, are bought and sold into slavery? for commercial labor and commercial sex. If God is 
all-powerful and all-good? Why is it that the Syrian war continues to rage on and has left over 470,000 people dead? Men, women, children, broken apart in the rubble of buildings that have been bombed out, gassed to death with chlorine. How is God good and all-powerful? If God is all good and he's all-powerful, why ISIS? Why is ISIS allowed to continue its murderous regime of, of torture and rape and enslavement? Why Boko Haram? Why the countless other groups who we don't even hear about because it doesn't serve our nation's political interest? And what about the wickedness of that? If God is all powerful and all good and he thinks the family is, is important, then why is it that countless numbers of family are forced to make the terrible decision to either remain in a dangerous and violent situation or risk a border crossing? And why are so many of those families ripped apart at the border? More so, why do so many people who claim to belong to that God not seem to care about that? And speaking of those who claim to belong to God, if God is all-powerful and he's all-good, why is it that around 90,000 Christians, people that God describes as his children, are murdered every year for their faith? Why is it that around 246 people, more than are in this room right now, more people who are Christians than are in this room today, will be killed simply because they name the name of Christ. How is God all good and all powerful? See, these aren't questions that we tend to talk about in church. But they're all throughout scripture. The reality of evil, the problem of evil, is never soft-served. It's never dumbed down. It's never played down. And these questions are obviously just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more. And if we take the problem of evil seriously, then like Habakkuk, we should cry out, why are you silent, O oh God? Why don't you do something? Why are you idle? Why does this exist at all? But these are the questions that the faithful should have. However, as I said last night, while, while we see that such questions are accepted and even encouraged throughout Scripture, we see at the same time that Scripture never resolves the problem of evil. It doesn't even try to. God doesn't give a full explanation in Habakkuk or anywhere else in Scripture to this issue. He makes no attempt to defend himself. He makes no attempt to try to satisfy all of our questions. I mean, Scripture, it gives us some clear boundaries. It does talk about how God is all-powerful. It talks about how God is all-good. It talks about the, the nature of human responsibility and that we have a part to play in this. But it never gives a solution. God never says all that we would like him to say on this subject. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright summarizes this, I think, helpfully in his book, Evil and the Justice of God. Here's what he says. He says, somehow, strangely, and to us sometimes even annoyingly, the creator God will not simply abolish evil from his world. The question that swirls around in these discussions is why not? And we are not given an answer. We are instead informed in no uncertain terms that God will contain evil, that he will restrain it, that he will prevent it from doing its worst, and he will even on occasion, such as Habakkuk, use the malice of human beings to further his own strange purposes. Strange purposes. God contains evil. He restrains evil. He will prevent it from doing its worst and might subvert it even to its own ends. These are the boundary points, but it is not an answer. It doesn't explain 
the tension we feel at these things. And there is no logical explanation given in the pages of Scripture to this problem. And I think that that's at least in part because it's inappropriate to try to do so. And what do I mean? But the Bible clearly portrays evil as an intruder in this world. It's something that doesn't belong. And I think in some sense, trying to find a satisfying explanation, trying to find a fully logical and fully rational reason for the problem of evil is trying to make room for it. But the evil is folly. That has no rightful place in this world. And God will not dignify it with a rationale or a reason for existing. It doesn't belong. However, while God doesn't give an explanation for the burdensome problem of evil, he does have an answer for Habakkuk and for us. And that's the silencing answer of judgment. Now, if you read through Habakkuk, and I'd encourage you to, I mean, you can read it in like 10 or 15 minutes a day. It's three chapters. But as you go through that, what you see is that throughout the book, we've seen it in chapters 1 and 2, God's stating that evil will not stand. He doesn't explain it. He doesn't say, here's why it's there. But he makes it very clear that it will not last. It will not remain forever. What he says is it's going to be judged and punished Right when Habakkuk brings his, his first complaint to God about the wickedness of the people of Judah, God says, yeah, and I'm going to judge them for it. He says, I'm going to judge them with the Chaldeans, and that's why Habakkuk raises that second complaint. But you know, they're worse than we are. And he says, yeah, and I'm going to judge them for that. And we have to admit right there that, that we hear that, and as modern Westerners, we don't really want to hear that. We don't like the language of judgment. That sounds harsh. That sounds like over the top. But there's some things that we should notice about these judgments. Because we can't avoid them. They're here. And the first thing is simply that they are fitting. This is not just vindictive retribution. When God talks about judgment in scripture, it's not him just lashing out when he's finally had enough. These are just judgments, and they're fitting. Think about it. When the people of God, who are supposed to reflect God and his ways in the world, look more like the pagan nations around them, God says, I'll give you to the pagan nations. He's essentially saying that, you know, you've become more like them to me, so to them you will go, and you'll see how they treat you. It's a punishment that fits the crime. To just judgment. And in the face of the wickedness of the, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, there's a description of them being puffed up or, or swollen and arrogant with their power and their military might. It, and the basic statement that God makes is he's going to deflate them. They've puffed themselves up with delusions of grandeur, and I am going to show them what their strength really comes to in my face. He's going to remove their pride. He's going to return them to an appropriate size. And again, it's a fitting judgment. And you see that in this judgment of Babylon described in in this series of five woes in chapter 2. This woe is a proclamation against them. And I'm just going to summarize these these quickly, but you just see that they, they fit. They go together. It's not disproportionate. In verses 6 through 8, essentially what we're we're told is that the plunderers will be plundered. In verses 9 through 11, we're told that the, the Chaldeans are building this house. They're building a legacy. They're trying to build a reputation, but it's built on blood and violence. And so by blood and violence, it will be forfeited. And even the house, the legacy that they're building, will speak against them. The beams... And the roof cries out. Verses 12 through 14, similarly, they built a city of iniquity, right? They're calling all to Babylon to see the power and the might of their empire. 
For the same way, it's built on blood and violence, and by blood and violence, it will go down. And more so, it will be forgotten. The fame of Babylon will crumble, while the knowledge of the Lord that they thought that they had spurned will cover the earth. Verses 15 through 18, the fourth woe, is that they made other nations drink the cup of their wrath. And it's a, that's a, a familiar image in the Old Testament, the cup of wrath that goes around and, and you're forced to drink it and experience all of its pain. They're doing this to other nations and they're stripping nations naked and exposing the, the shame of their weakness before all. And what does God say? The cup will come around. You've made others drink from the cup of wrath and you're going to drink from mine. And I will expose your uncircumcision. I will reveal the weakness and shame that you have. The fifth woe is their idolatry. And again, their idolatry was ultimately a trust in themselves and their, their military strength. And that is going to be revealed for the folly that it is. And in the description of their idols, basically what God is saying is, I'm going to let you depend on your gods. You've made much of your Babylonian gods and how your strength is the proof of their value. Go ahead and depend on them and see what happens. You will fall apart because they are truly silent. They can't speak. And yet his presence fills the world and before him all remain silent. And what's more fitting and just in this judgment is is you see in verse 6 here, Who's delivering it? God is speaking judgment, but who is delivering the message to the Chaldeans? It's all the peoples that they ruined. He's gathering together the nations that they thought they destroyed, and they are speaking the woes over their oppressors. It's like the ultimate victim impact statement. They get the final word against those who destroyed them. They get to declare God's justice and judgment over their victimizers. And again, what we see here is that this punishment fits the crime. God is showing Habakkuk that while there's a lot he doesn't understand, he needs to know that God is just. He is paying attention. He does see. He will not be idle. And it should be noted that All of these things came to pass. All these prophecies came to pass. Judah falls to the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, like 10 or 15 years later after this letter is written. And then Babylonians fall to the Persians in 539 BC. These are not idle words. And what, who, how many of you spend your days thinking about the glory of Babylon? They've been forgotten, except in history books. And yet the knowledge of the Lord has continued to spread and cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. These prophecies are not idle words. They have come to be. And the second thing we should notice about these judgments is the fact that it silences all the questions. God is enacting these judgments because they're right and they're good, but it actually brings a conclusion to what the book started with. The book starts with Habakkuk's questions and complaints, and by the end of chapter 2, he has no more. We'll see tomorrow morning that he has some more to say in chapter 3, but there are no more questions. No more complaints. He, He says, I will trust you. And and one thing you should notice, and this is more just kind of, here's your Bible study pro tip. As you go through Habakkuk 1 and 2, there's tons of irony. Right? You see some of it in these judgments, right? God's people become like the pagans, so do the pagans they go. The pagans are are puffed up with their might, so their might will be popped out. Right? There's this poetic justice that's a bit ironic, but there's more. Remember what Habakkuk's complaints are centered on? God's apparent idleness and silence. 
The silence of God is a theme throughout the book. In the face of evil, why doesn't he say something? Habakkuk's saying a whole lot of things, and God doesn't seem to respond. He seems to have nothing to say. What's going on? And even in verse 213, you see that that's the very question, right? Why are you silent? But even in the woes, we, we see a parallel of this. Right? The Babylonians go to their silent stones. Their silent idols who cannot answer them. But then in verse 20 here, we get like the ultimate mic drop. That, that God the Lord is in his holy temple and all the earth will remain silent before him. It's as if he's saying, right, like in the, the desperation of faithful Habakkuk, he, he's questioning and questioning and questioning, and you're quiet, you're quiet, you're quiet. As soon as God speaks, he shuts up. And the Babylonians are taunting everybody. They, they think, you're silent, God doesn't do anything. We can do anything we want to because he's idle and he doesn't say anything. And God speaks and they shut up. What Habakkuk is saying is that when God does show up, he isn't idle and he isn't quiet. When he speaks, everyone is silenced. And we will see tomorrow that there are more questions more things to say, but no questions. Because these judgments reveal the folly of evil for what it is. Right? Because if the Babylonians are right, then they should do the things they're doing. They should glory in their might. The strong should oppress the weak. The rich should oppress the poor. You should just get by and get whatever you can if God is silent. But if he is in his holy temple, if he is going to speak, then that doesn't work. And it's in his judgment that I, I think God still works to silence many of our questions. Because what God is telling us through the reality of his judgment is that he actually does see. And I think that that, that answer of judgment does a lot of things, but, but key among them is that it exposes our hypocrisy. Right? We, we are content culturally and generationally to just accuse God of being idle, to, to bring up the problem of evil. Those things that I mentioned earlier and last night, they, they're real things we should ask, right? And we, we raise these to God. We look at the evil of the world and we say, why do you let this happen? Why don't you do something? And we're like culturally arrogant about that. Yet at the same time, when God says what he's going to do, we go, that's not cool, man. Right? He, he says that he's going to do something. He's going to wipe them out and ultimately condemn them to hell. And we say, that's, that's a bit harsh. Exposes our hypocrisy. We claim to have a big problem with evil, and yet we don't want to take it as seriously as God takes it. Right? If I tell you I'm going to preach a sermon on judgment, you're like, no thanks. I don't want to hear that. That's like, that's fire and brimstone fundamentalist preaching. We don't, we don't need that. And there's a hypocrisy in this, right? We accuse God of doing nothing and then complain about what he does. We say he's harsh and ungracious and unloving. Yet might it be that like Habakkuk, God sees better than we do. Might his promise of judgment, his promise to judge sin in this life and the next, might it not silence us by showing us that he actually is more serious about the problem of evil than we are? That he is the God who hears. He is the God who hears every cry of every victim, every minute of every day. He is the God who sees. He's everywhere. And he, he sees and experiences every single injustice, every single oppression, every single act of violence and abuse that I described earlier. He's there when those 470,000 people are killed. He's there when those 90,000 children of his are murdered. He's there when those millions of people are treated as slaves and bought and sold. He sees. See, 
If we saw like him, we might not think his words of judgment were disproportionate. We might have a different perspective on the need for judgment. And, you know, in our dislike of judgment, we've even created this false tension, right? We like to think, like, judgment and wrath, that's, that's Old Testament stuff. That's the Old Testament God. I like the New Testament God. He's, he's gracious and loving. And it's false tension because if you actually study the Old Testament, there is just as much about the grace and love of God in the Old Testament as there is in the New. And there's just as much, if not more, about the judgment and wrath of God in the New Testament than there is in the Old. I mean, yeah, right? Jesus, meek and mild. Jesus, who comes to serve. But Jesus, the King and the Lord, who will come with a sword in his mouth to judge the nations and hold them to account. Jesus, who actually in the pages of Scripture has the most explicit things to say about the reality of punishment and eternal death in hell. Who says that the wicked will not escape. And Jesus, who actually intensifies the problem of evil. Have you ever realized that? Jesus intensifies the problem of evil by saying, it's not a problem out there somewhere. It's not out in the world. It's right here. It's right here. He says, yeah, murder's a problem, but you know what's, what's the root of that? Is your anger. Adultery is a problem, but your every lustful look is a problem. The problem of evil isn't something obscure and abstract and removed. Jesus is showing us that it's right inside every single one of our hearts. It is our problem of evil. And of course, that raises concerns. And maybe it's partly why we don't like thinking about judgment, because if we thought consistently about it, we might have to acknowledge that it should fall on us. All right, I'm not a Babylonian, but I might look more like the nation of Judah who claimed to belong to God, who should have resembled him and yet then was apathetic about oppression and injustice, apathetic to the point of hiring false prophets to tickle their ears and say what they wanted to hear. That can be kind of like that. You know, uh, we were talking this morning at breakfast. Some of you have seen The, the Good Place. Uh, and I don't, spoiler alert, season three, there's this great scene where they think, right, you know, it's this whole holding account of, you know, who deserves to go to the good place, who goes to the bad place. And there's this scene in, in, in the third season because they think that hell has hijacked the system. They think like, oh, you know, they've, they've rigged it so that nobody can get into the good place. And they discover like, oh, they haven't rigged anything. We actually just are doing more bad than good. Life has become so complex and, and so hard. It's actually impossible to get to the good place. Well, if we thought about the complexity of evil in our own lives, we'd see that that is our issue. If it was an issue of earning it, we can't. The problem of evil isn't something that lies out there. It lies in your heart. And it deserves the same kind of judgment described in these chapters of Habakkuk. And that would absolutely terrify us if it weren't for the costly hope of grace. Now, if you're a Christian, right, you know there's forgiveness. You know there's mercy. There's grace. There's the removal of sins. And yet I sympathize with my unbelieving friends who hear the way some Christians talk about forgiveness and grace and mercy and say, that sounds like a cop-out. That sounds too easy. You're telling me that the sex offender can just have his spiritual slate wiped clean. That the murderer and the serial killer on his deathbed can, can just say, I believe in Jesus, and now it doesn't matter. I, I understand what they're getting at. It sounds like cheap grace. It doesn't sound like there's any justice in that. And I think many of us in the church can portray grace that cheaply. 
And it, it's why we have to remember that the hope of grace is actually costly. The gospel, people, is not about God ignoring your evil. It is not about God simply overlooking your evil and pretending it doesn't exist. The gospel is about God bearing his own judgment for your evil. 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who knew no sin to turn a blind eye to sin. No. To be sin for you. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, the promise of grace is this. Jesus is plundered for the plunderers. Jesus receives the violence that should have come to us. Jesus is the one who is brought to nothing because of our iniquity. He receives the wrath. He drinks the cup empty. He's the one who stripped naked and hung on a cross, scorned and shamed and despised and ridiculed. Tripp and I were talking about this morning, right? We sanitize the Bible and we sanitize the cross. We turn it into jewelry. The cross is a bloody instrument of torture and execution, of public shame and disgrace. And beyond that, for Jesus, it was suffering the eternal wrath of God for sin. He lost the presence of his Father, whom he had known forever. If we don't value that, we turn the cross into a trinket, an ornament. Don't mishear me. I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't wear a cross. But maybe if you do, if somebody ever asks you, like, how much did that cost? You say, it cost the, the, the blood of my eternal king. That's what that is. Right? Salvation does not equal no justice. Salvation is Jesus being judged for you. God brings justice to every single sin. Jesus is destroyed for you. And I know that that can sound harsh, but it's incredibly important to remember because if you don't, you won't take it seriously. Why did the people of God in Habakkuk go so far astray? I think the evidence of scripture is that they became presumptuous about grace. They, they treated it as just a religious exercise to talk about the sacrifices. And even as Christians, right, we can rest in grace. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. You can find comfort and hope and confidence in grace, yet you've got to take the cost of that grace seriously. You've got to take it seriously so that you never take it lightly. And I'll just tell you, like, there is nothing more terrifying to me as a pastor or I think more dangerous than a Christian who takes their sin lightly. Because you've not thought about the cost. And if you read the New Testament, it is all about the radical free offer of grace, but it is also full of some of the sternest warnings the same sorts of warnings that go out to God's people in the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul says that if after receiving Christ, you continue to sin as if it is of no cost, you are grieving the Holy Spirit. The author of Hebrews says that if you continue sinning as if it's not a big deal, you are trampling the blood of Christ. In the words of Revelation, if you don't take it serious, Jesus will spit you out of his mouth. Not because your seriousness earns your salvation, but because your salvation came at a cost. It is free to you, but it cost him everything. I'm reminded of the story that Jesus tells in Luke 7. Right? He goes to a party with a bunch of religious leaders, people who thought they were doing fine. They thought they could make a few sacrifices. Their sin was sorted out. And this sinful woman comes in and begins to anoint Jesus' feet, and they're scorning her. And he tells this story about the debt collector who forgives some debt. And he says there was one person who had a little bit of debt, and there was one person who had a lot of debt, an immense debt. He says, which one do you think will love the, 
the money collector more. Well, I guess the one who's forgiven more. And Jesus says, you're right. Those who are forgiven little love little. Those who are forgiven much love much. And this woman went away weeping with joy because she knew she had a real debt and it was wiped clean. Right? If you don't take seriously the judgment that you deserve, you won't be amazed by the cross. You'll think it's something God owes you. But it's not. You won't treasure the fact that he endured judgment for you. But the more you understand the reality, not just of evil out there somewhere, but the evil right here, and what it cost him, and how much of a problem it was, and what he endured to remove it from you, the more you'll be moved with gratitude and joy. The more you reflect on the fact that he didn't do that out of obligation, he did it because he loves you you, that he endured the scorn and the shame of the cross. He bore the judgment that you were owed because he loves you. The more you will love him. That is what will transform you. That's what will lead you from presumption into gratitude. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we acknowledge that we complain a lot, and sometimes rightly so, because uh, we are troubled by all the evil that we see around us. Lord, help us to be just as troubled at the see- evil that we, we see within us. Help us to see that evil. Help us to see that while we don't really like your words of judgment and we think they're harsh, that, that we're actually hypocritical in that. We want you to do something about evil, but not quite that much. We want you to take it seriously, and yet we presume to judge you when you do. Forgive us for that. Forgive us for our divided hearts and our divided minds on this issue. Help us to see that you are just, that you do not have a divided opinion on evil, and that is a good thing. And let the knowledge of your right and just judgment not drive us to despair, but drive us to Christ. Let the knowledge of our evil enable us to come to him in true humility because we know we need him. Let us know that we cannot endure the judgment we deserve, but that he has endured it for us. Help us to see what our evil has cost you and help us to love you more because of it. Help us to be transformed of it as we see the love of Christ for us. Help us to be amazed at it. And guide us in this way of gratitude as we recognize that you are just, but you are gracious and loving as well. Guide us to Christ in these things. In his name we pray. Amen.